Traveling to Australia from the cold north is no joke. Every time I make this journey, I feel like a zombie at the end of it. But this time, we tried something different. We usually opt for the quickest route possible, at around 25 hours. But after the pandemic, the number of flights were significantly reduced, which kind of forced us to go for a much longer route at 41 hours. The funny thing is, I think I actually prefer it that way. This time, I decided to document our journey, an insight on what it's like and some tips along the way. This is how to survive one of the longest flight journeys in the world. There are mainly two ways of getting to Australia from Europe, via Southeast Asia or the Arab Gulf states. When traveling so far, it's crucial to have as few layovers as possible. More stops equals longer travel time and in general more stress. That's why we chose to fly via Doha, the only transfer on our trip. Flying via Dubai was also possible, but more expensive. And at the time, there were no direct flights to Southeast Asia from Norway. My dream route, however, would probably be a layover in Hong Kong, Taipei or Manila, as they are located on the straight line between Oslo and Sydney. Sadly, that doesn't exist. So, who are we? Well, I'm Norwegian and my partner's Australian. We did long distance relationship for a few years, and it's obviously not very easy. To close the gap, we decided to live one year in each other's country to test things out. 2020 being Norway and 2021 Australia. That was the plan. But the words plan and 2020 does not mix very well together. We were essentially stuck for an extra year in Norway. It was practically impossible to fly down. Sydney alone had a flight passenger cap on only 30 to 35 people per flight. Getting on one of those flights were hard, expensive, and they would often get cancelled. But after 37.5 million seconds, or 435 days, we were finally able to embark on the journey down under. Okay, it's time to pack your carry-on. You've heard it before, don't overpack. There's no need to pack five heavy books you won't read. So, this is what I dragged along with me. A headphone jack converter so I can use my own noise-cancelling headphones and not the cheap airplane ones. A shaver, just the essential toiletries. An empty bag for used face masks. A case filled with all my cables and tech gear. Don't forget the pen to fill out immigration papers. Nintendo Switch if you're a gamer. Face masks. Water bottle. A travel wallet to keep your passport and other important documents safe. One change of clothes. DJI Osmo Pocket if you're a YouTuber. And my laptop so I can watch YouTube videos or do work. And that's it. The first leg of the journey took six hours. Then, we had a 21-hour layover in Doha, followed by a 14-hour flight to Sydney. We didn't want to leave the airport during our layover, as strict COVID restrictions were still in place. So we were stuck inside the airport terminal for 21 hours. But more on that later. Since I've done this journey back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth, I've managed to gain some airline points. Thus, we were actually able to upgrade from economy to business class for the first time in our lives. By all means, this is not necessary, but it was a dream that finally came true. There was just one catch. We only had business class for the first six hour long flight. It was back to economy on the second flight, which is kinda where you need business the most. Whoa, that's a lot of space. I'll get back to the seat in a sec. Business class in Qatar Airways has dine on demand, meaning you can just eat whenever you feel like it. As two eager kids, we went for the starter course straight away. Every meal is presented nicely on actual plates with a fake LED candle light. The food was definitely on a fine dining level with a decent alcoholic and non-alcoholic drink selection. To finish off, we had a dessert with a warm, soothing Karak Chai. The toilet is very similar to the one in economy class, just slightly bigger, 
It has hand lotion and uh, facial water, which I didn't really use. There are heaps of shaving and dental amenities, which is great if you have the sudden urge to shave mid-flight. There's a lovely view into the darkness, and a whopping three mirrors. Now that's business class for you. Of course, there's a seat specifically designated to tie your shoes. Don't you dare using it for anything else. But what came next is something that truly impressed me the most. I can open the bin with my foot. I am lost for words. While I was busy being speechless in the toilet, my partner went for some fine cheese. Because why not? This was a Boeing 787-9 flight, meaning the famous Q-suites were not installed on board. Just look at that double bed configuration, wow. The 787-9 was actually too narrow for the Q-suites, therefore we sat in the slightly modified version, but I am not complaining. I mean, privacy doors, you kind of forget that you're surrounded with other passengers and flight attendants. The leg space is just so ridiculous that it hurts thinking that I won't be able to experience this in a while. There's a storage room, mirror, and wireless charging for your phone. Now we're talking. The screen was massive, and could be controlled by touch or remote. I did encounter some problems though. It wasn't very responsive, and the remote did not work. After a restart by a flight attendant, it worked buttery smooth. And look at that, there's only just enough time left to watch a film before we land. Suddenly, six hours seemed way too short. It was time to recline my seat to a completely flat bed, grab my blankets and uh, these cushions which are giving me peak live laugh love vibes. Let's also not forget the amenity kit, which included lip balm, moisturiser, facial mist, earplugs, eye masks and socks, plus a protective kit with a face mask, sanitizer, and gloves. Quickest six hours of my life. Farewell business class, maybe we'll meet again sometime in the future. Up next was a security check in a very hot room filled with other transferring passengers. Right, so we've intentionally chosen a 21 hour layover inside the terminal without leaving the building. Why would we do this? So we can get a full night's sleep in a hotel room. Yeah, it costs a little extra, but it's so worth it when traveling to the other side of the world. Feeling refreshed before the next 14 hour long flight does magical wonders. After gazing out on the scenic view, it was time to check out Arabic television. Featuring channels such as airport staff training videos, and my favorite channel, the Air Canada logo. I don't know why there's a phone next to the toilet, perhaps for when you run out of toilet paper. I forgot to mention, don't bring an international power adapter. The wall sockets in the airport and on the planes will most likely fit your plug type. Additionally, if you're planning on staying at the Oryx Airport Hotel, don't forget to bring swimwear. The hotel includes free access to a pool which no one really seemed to be using. I mean, I get it, not everyone packs swimwear in their carry-on. Having a swim and a shower was the ultimate way of feeling refreshed on this long journey. Hamad International Airport has your usual duty-free shops, gyms, creepy art, and of course an elevated train. It's a huge airport. However, I can't deny the fact that travelling with Qatar Airways gives a somewhat bitter taste in my mouth. It's ranked as the best airline in the world, and I'm very pleased with the service. Still, it is fully owned by the state of Qatar, who have been criticised for their abuse of human rights. The same thing can also be applied to some other nations and airlines. So are there any other alternatives? It's one of many ethical questions associated with travelling. I haven't even talked about the climate aspect of it, which is obviously not ideal. I won't dwell on this for too long, I just wanted to mention it. Do your own research and travel responsibly. Next up was the lounge, which had unlimited food. The food selection is just okay. In fact, it seems like it's the same food they serve in flight. I mean, doesn't this look similar? I'm not complaining though. It's a clever way of reusing their assets. 
They even used an airplane food trolley in the lounge. How cute. Now, just because the food is complimentary doesn't mean you have to eat everything. We tried that, our stomachs were overfilled, not recommended. The next and final flight is a long one, 14 hours. To put it into perspective, imagine a regular day where you wake up at 7 in the morning and do your daily tasks. And after a long day, you go to bed at 10. That's 14 hours. When the plane takes off, you're essentially starting a new day and you won't land until the day is over. First, it was time for the third security screening, which feels a bit unnecessary, but okay, whatever. What I hate most is that you can't bring any liquid onto this flight. No water in your water bottle, nothing. And it's so important to stay hydrated when flying because the air-conditioned air is just so dry. So you have to keep asking the flight attendant for more water, which is more work for them, which doesn't make any sense, and I'm always salty about it. We passed through business class seats equipped with Q-suites, but alas, it was time to humbly sit down in our economy class seats. With screaming babies. Oof. The seat was pretty basic. Okay leg room, a seat pocket, a foldable tray, a touchscreen which has a privacy coating on it, a USB outlet, an airplane headphone port, and a remote that's supposed to be removable, but mine didn't work. The amenity ticket included a toothbrush, toothpaste, air plug, eye mask, and socks. We chose to sit in the front of the plane, as you'll usually experience less engine noise there. If I'm travelling by myself, I always choose the aisle seat on long-haul flights. It makes it so much easier to stretch your legs and access the bag when you need it. However, this time when travelling with my partner, we chose the window and middle seats. I kinda needed a window seat for this video. You'll most likely stare at a screen for a long period of time on these flights. To give my eyes a rest, I usually listen to a podcast while eating. The meal was actually alright. It's just, you know, back to reality. Time for toilet review part 2. It was similar to the one in business class, just more compact and without the same amenities. Don't forget to brush your teeth and use bottled water, not the disgusting airplane tap water. Just don't. I don't have any footage of this, but my partner spotted two empty business class seats when we were taking off. Three hours into the flight, we went to the galley area, and she asked if we could move seats to business. The flight attendant was just smiling and shook his head. It didn't help either that we had flown with business on the previous flight. He had no power to do so, as it is the airline's policy. Which, I mean, is totally fair, we hadn't paid for it. To make up for us not getting access to business, he gave us a ton of snacks. We just wanted like two chips bags, but he insisted that we had to try everything. So, how do you exactly make time pass by? Sleep. But if you can't sleep, here are some ideas. The obvious ones are of course to watch films, but I get a little restless if I'm not doing something. That's why I prefer to play video games, or simply clean up the hard drive on my laptop. I also downloaded plenty of YouTube videos to watch on my laptop. But it's not easy to use the laptop when the person in front of you fully reclines their seat. You can also play trivia games, listen to music, or do seat yoga. Either way, whatever you do, don't check the time. It's so tempting, but time will move super slow. You'll check it once, then do something else for a bit. You think it has been one hour, but it has actually been just 20 minutes. That hurts. Don't do that. The airline really wants you to sleep for the majority of the flight. More people sleeping equals less inquiries and work for the staff. I can't sleep while sitting, I need to lay down on my side. It's really frustrating for me when they turn off all the lights. Because of course, it makes me sleepy, but I'm put into a limbo. I get extremely tired and my eyes are struggling to stay open, but I'm not falling asleep. I want to stay awake, but the darkness makes it very difficult. And when there's sunrise outside, you're told to pull down the window blinds, which means I can't look at the view, and I have to sit in the darkness surrounded by people sleeping. It's not fun. As the sun is setting, it's time to reflect on the journey we've been through. 
We started off on Tuesday afternoon and now it's Thursday evening. We've covered nearly 16,000 kilometers spanning 8 time zones. But being able to get a full night's sleep midway through the journey truly did wonders. Don't get me wrong, I was still tired after the end of this flight, but I didn't feel like a zombie. At this point, I realised I hadn't had fresh air in 41 hours. Anyways, welcome to Australia. You just watched the first episode of T2 Abroad, a new series where I share my experiences of living down under. Don't forget to subscribe to see more videos of this series and my other ongoing series, Japanese Music Discoveries. There's a lot of new content on its way. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.